Kia in India, yes, that says it all and we announced the arrival of the Korean brand at the Auto Expo a few days ago. Now I'm at ground zero for Kia, the plant site in Anantpur in Andhra Pradesh. More than 600 acres and this plant is going to be massive. You can see that a large part of the construction is already underway. That's going to be the final assembly shop and uh, it's a massive acre, huge campus like I said. And this side is uh, where you can see a lot of the other construction that's already begun as well. Now. 300,000 cars a year, that's the initial installed capacity. It's already being thought that it will be upped by another 100,000 units. Chief Minister N. Chandra Babu Naidu was here and he mentioned that in his speech, which means Kia is looking to go really aggressive, big time and very quickly. Now, the plant itself, you can see that this there's enough space here for an expansion. So uh, when we talk about 300,000 or even 400,000, all of that could even be doubled in quick time because the investments are being sunk in. Two billion dollars is what Kia will invest between now and 2021. A lot of details on this we have for you now and I can tell you one more thing. This construction is already two months ahead of schedule. The Rio is the premium hatchback from Kia and I do hope it makes an appearance in our market pretty soon. It does share a lot in terms of platform and underpinnings and engines with the i20 from Hyundai, of course. Similar sized car, similar attribute, but very nice looking. Now, the i20 recently got a massive facelift. The global facelift, in fact, debuted at the Auto Expo just a few days ago as well. And I have all the details now on the car for you. The current generation Hyundai i20 was launched in 2014 and has been a runaway success thanks to its sharp styling, frugal engines and a long list of features. Since 2014, Hyundai has sold more than 3 lakh units of the i20 globally. Take India and Hyundai has sold over 10,000 every month last year except for December. It is one of the best selling models from Hyundai and certainly in its class. So it was about time that the i20 got its midlife facelift and Hyundai launched it in style at the recently concluded Auto Expo. It was a world debut as well of the facelift. And while we hope for really significant styling changes, Hyundai decided to play it safe and so the changes aren't a whole lot. So the big changes on any facelift are usually in the face and that's the case with the i20 as well. Now I like the orange color borrowed or carried over from the Verna and it certainly suits the character of the i20. Now it's a good looking car always was and it kind of enhances that a little bit by trying to go a little premium. The Cascade grille, I've not been a fan of it in the past but I have to say on the i20 it really works beautifully. It stretches out the face, makes it look a little wider and makes the stance of the car look a little bolder. So I like that. It's also finished in an interesting sort of a pattern which works well. Daytime running lights now get added on to this. Only the Active had it earlier, remember? So the whole face, therefore, with the new revised bumper and grille and the enhanced headlight uh, trimming does give the car a slightly new look. Now, the new color, of course, certainly helps to add to that. Along the sides, you pretty much pick up the same cues. Nothing much has changed. There's a new alloy pattern, but not a whole lot. But again, when you come to the back is where you see the big drastic change because the tail light and the tailgate are new. The car I'm driving today is the top spec diesel variant of the i20 facelift with a manual gearbox. Hyundai cars are always known for having a comprehensive list of features and so on this model it's no different. But from besides what we've showed you, the car also gets 16 inch wheels which have a new alloy pattern. Those are only available on the Asta and Asta option variant. Then you got the chrome door handles which add a premium touch and safety equipment on board consists of 8 airbags that includes side and curtain airbags, though only at the top end. I've always liked the fact that the i20 had a lot of safety features standard for some time now, even before the facelift. So the dual airbags, ABS, ISOFIX, and uh, the layout has changed a little bit. So it's not a huge jump, but it's an enhancement. And so you get a new touch screen. It has all the connectivity features for your smartphone and all of that. 
camera control was always there, the steering controls were always there, updated seat fabric makes it look a little bit fresher I suppose and you've got a drop down armrest at the rear now with cup holders which is a segment first. Hyundai has carried over both the petrol and diesel engine variants of the current model, not necessarily a bad thing. We like the engines because they are efficient and decent on par. The performance isn't a whole lot different because mechanically nothing has changed. It is a facelift after all, but Hyundai says that it's reworked the tuning on the engines to offer a little bit of a punchier performance while the output numbers remain the same. And on the diesel side of things, fuel efficiency therefore is enhanced by 9%. Now, what about the competition? We've already said that the Hyundai i20 bests both the Baleno and the Jazz. But when it comes to the automatic side of things, well, then the Jazz starts to play a bigger role. Now, when it came to the shootout between these cars, the i20 has always been our consistent winner, except when you talk about the automatic space, which is becoming very important. So, the Jazz CVT is certainly the benchmark in that particular respect beats the Baleno and certainly beats the four-speed automatic that the i20 used to have. Now I say used to have because there's a lack of clarity from Hyundai on what happens to the new automatic. At the time this car was launched at the Auto Expo, no prices were revealed for the automatic variant and so Hyundai says that the automatic i20 will only arrive around May this year and we are hoping that it moves from the four-speed to a five-speed gearbox. <laughs> A lot has changed since the first BMW X3 arrived in 2003. The second generation was a vastly improved car that came in 2010 and on queue in 2017, BMW drove in the third generation car. The new one does what any new generation is meant to, it improves the product. But that it does so by literally improving in all departments is a credit to the prowess of the latest BMW SUV. I used to love how the last X3 would handle but had reservations on how it looked. And so I was very glad to see a good looking model when the new car first came out in Frankfurt last year. I got a chance to drive the new X3 a few weeks ago and while most people had the chance to initially test drive only the top models, the X3 M40i and the X3 30D, a bulk of sales will come from the 20D and also a 20i petrol that's also now been introduced since BMW knows there is a shift towards petrol. In India too, BMW is going with the X3, X-Drive 30D and 20D for starters, though nothing is confirmed as yet. The Auto Expo was after all just a debut showcase and not a market launch. My chance to drive the 20D came of all the places in Japan. So I got my hands on the variant most hadn't driven yet in the bustling traffic of Tokyo and the fast highways on its outskirts. Now, I never imagined I would be driving a new BMW model in Japan, but uh, I'm glad in the sense that I've got to do it because I missed out on uh, being able to go to Lisbon where the global drive happened. Now, the new X3, I showed it to you from the Frankfurt Motor Show in the M Sport trim, and that is the car here with me as well. This is the 2 litre diesel in the M Sport trim. It is the car that's definitely coming to India. The car looks mature, elegant and has a sense of quality in its wonderfully crafted skin. The good metal surfacing lends it that air and yet it maintains a good SUV stance and musculature due to its proportions. BMW's new design language for SUVs, first seen on the X2 concept, is a step in the right direction. The X3 exemplifies a good marriage between technology and style SUV and crossover, so it looks good and yet will therefore appeal to a much wider audience. Now you can see in terms of styling just how different the new car is. That's the old X3, this is the new one. The face is of course very typical of the new BMW look. Big kidney grille, the uh, almost unraveling twin rings there 
and uh, in terms of technology as well it brings in a lot of what you've seen on the 7 on the 5 series and uh, the look is somewhat similar to what you've seen on the X1 the car doesn't look as bulky as before it looks a little more streamlined looks sportier too and the side profile overall has gotten so much better so the car is certainly a lot more attractive now the interior is also majorly updated and thank god for that the cabin seems roomier fresher and definitely more modern now gesture control one of the many things that you now get on the x3 yes the cabin layout is uh, completely new but it's really the technologies that have come across the screen gesture control even the uh, display key which is so much like what we've seen on the 5 series as well it gives you a lot more functionality it makes it cooler you also have the wireless phone charging uh, for certain models here uh, besides of course all sorts of integration and connectivity features as well from a comfort perspective as well the cabin has gotten a lot nicer looking it's better finished like i said but it's also a little more comfortable that the position of the wheel and the seat is a lot better start stop button is more visible and of course you get the virtual cluster as well so really a lot going for it again the distinction between this and the last car is really huge so big changes where the changes were needed big time on the last car the strongest attribute was its road characteristic it handled and responded superbly for a vehicle of its shape and size and weight using the new BMW 5 series platform has allowed the X3 to shed up to 55 kilos while still improving on its chassis stiffness and ride quality yes it is still 51 millimeters longer and 10 millimeters wider than the earlier car, by the way. And you pick up on that almost instantly. Not the loss in weight, but that enhanced performance. The new X3 will steer more confidently as well, and the engine will not seem wanting at any point until you go test the 3 liter beast in the 30D. The 20D is quick, responsive, and the 8 speed ZF derived gearbox is also nice and quick through the changes. Now I've driven the car mainly in city traffic today and uh, luckily the roads here in Japan, especially here in the Odaiba area, are really nice and wide. So I've managed to push it around just a very little bit. The immediate impression you get, especially compared to the old car, is just how much sportier it's gotten. It is a big relief because uh, I should like the way the old X3 drove a lot. Uh, it was pretty dynamic in its own way but now it seems like it's sitting slightly closer to the ground it's gotten a lot more exciting and frankly i can't wait to get it out on the highway and push it a little harder and finally i did get that chance and boy did the car stay true to its promise the 20d does not have the adaptive dampers that the 30d does yet it's a sporty ride just the same in fact, I'll stick my neck out that barring the Porsche Macan and the 3-liter Jaguar F-Pace, the X3 will seem like the sportiest of the pack. And that pack is quite large now, with five other players besides the three cars I've just mentioned. Handling is rear biased, since the X-Drive will send more torque to the rear wheels at most times, but it of course changes torque distribution based on traction needs at each wheel. Prices will be revealed when the car officially launches within the next quarter. The new X3 will be made locally in BMW's Chennai plant, of course, and so expect prices to be competitive and in line with the recent debutants that will rival the X3 in this class. So as I said, the X3 is here in India now and we've got our chance with the car before anybody else can, right out of the Auto Expo, straight off of that Expo floor in fact. Now, this car will no doubt form the bulk of sales for this model line in India as well. By this car, I again mean the 20D. The 30D and the 20i, well, you'll have some takers, but really, for now, it is going to be that 2-litre diesel that drives things. Which then brings me to the interesting point. 2-litre diesel, 2-litre diesel on my left and right. And a very unusual sort of a situation where, unlike what happens always all over the world, a rare sort of situation where all of these cars in their new generation 
have literally launched within what like a 50 60 day period of each other that is very very unusual <laughs> So we saw it happen last year with the 5 series and the E-Class both arriving in the same year but that was even globally in many ways. Here in India it's a delayed launch from Audi. The Q5 has really come to us much much later than the global debut but I'm glad it's finally here because it sets a new sort of benchmark of refinement for this segment. <laughs> And it's the sheer practicality and superior build quality of the Volvo XC60 that compels us to give it a really close look as well. Now the Scandinavians have done really well with the new XC60 and you might ask me, hey, what about the rest of the competition? You just mentioned five other cars, right? Well, don't worry, I am going to talk about the GLC from Mercedes-Benz, the Discovery Sport from Land Rover and the way these cars are spec'd up at their top end, you have to simply drag in cars like the Macan, the F-Pace and also the new Range Rover Velar. Now the Volvo XC60 is really testimony to what's been happening at Volvo. Great Scandinavian design, a huge turnaround in terms of styling and appeal. The XC90 had it, the S90 had it, the XC60 certainly gets it in truckloads. It's also a beautifully finished cabin. You get a nice sense of quality and fit and finish from it and it's also beautifully specced. So in terms of gadgets and uh, all the fun stuff that younger buyers especially want, well, the XC60 certainly packs in a whole lot of that. Now, coming back to the point about why we don't have the other cars here, remember, I keep making the same point that these three cars are the ones that have just driven into the market. So they are brand new and they're literally going head to head against each other. The Discovery Sport recently got a price fix and then you've got the GLC that's been doing moderately well as well for uh, Mercedes-Benz. Now, the Q5 I mentioned is the refinement benchmark. It would be nice to see more engines coming in from Audi. There is a petrol promise to us later in the year as well. But this car does everything right. It ticks so many boxes. And yet, when this car first came out in uh, the end of 2016, I remember driving it and telling you in our exclusive review that uh, it just doesn't seem to push on the emotional front far away from the last car. So the last car was great. This one's great. But it doesn't do that little bit extra. So what about the X3? Now, I've made the point that the X3 was a very practical, pragmatic, capable sort of a car, but it was never good looking, it was never pretty, it wasn't appealing. Now, on the inside, it certainly is miles ahead of where the last car was, and even on the outside, it's got a lot of presence. It's the tallest of these three, and uh, it's got this really imposing face up front. So, hmm, finally, the X3 also starts to become appealing. So it's gonna be really interesting to see where these cars end up, maybe by the end of this year. So the Audi Q5 does everything right. It's also got the muscle and the beef and the presence on the road. It's quite nice looking and uh, the only thing it misses out on is that little emotional connect and it isn't quite as sporty as I would have liked. And then you've got the XC60 which does again so much right. Looks absolutely gorgeous. Very elegant, a lot of presence but because of its low roof line doesn't necessarily have the butch SUV appeal that a lot of buyers do look for in this particular space. So, emotional, yes. Capable and practical, yes. And it's almost a coincidence, you won't believe me. We didn't plan it this way when we parked these three cars. But yes, the balance that a lot of people will look for in this space certainly does come from the new X3, something this nameplate lacked. And now, with this new generation, delivers by a long shot. <laughs> So which is the car to really buy then? Well it comes down to it, 
you're looking for an SUV and that's where the XC60 doesn't have that massive presence that you typically want from a big SUV even though these may be the compacts. The Q5 certainly has the muscle, the beef, but like I said, loses out a little bit on that emotional pull and connect. So two ends of the spectrum, which means the car which has the perfect balance for now as far as I'm concerned, cliched as it is, the new one.